day. We're back. We're live. We're here in the, in the second show of our business day, uh, and, and here on a given Monday. And our special guest is Chris Dara, uh, Dr. Chris Dara to you guys. And uh, he is with HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of, of Geophysics and Planetology. And there'll be a short examination. We have to, you have to write that out. So if I say HIGP, everybody has to know that <laughs> it's the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And it's a very sexy name because it does very sexy things. Welcome to the show, Chris. Aloha, Jay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you about uh, the science we do. I'm delighted to have you here, yeah. So tell us how you got into science in the first place. Was there a moment or a teacher or a class or a course or an event in your life that made you, you know, have an aha moment? Uh, it, it was a long road. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in, in Poland on a farm. Uh, my grandfather was the farmer. My father actually was in technology field. He was an electronic engineer. He worked at a radar facility at an airport. Uh, so I always appreciated the nature and uh, you know how you interact with natural resources and everything. But I was also fascinated with, with technology, with uh, electronics, with computers. Um, I, I had a, a knack for, for math and physics, so I went to college to study physical chemistry. What college? Uh, this was back in Poland. Yeah. Uh, university is called Adam Mickiewicz University. It's located in a very nice city uh, called Poznań, mm -hmm. far away from here. <laughs> <laughs> I never dreamed about leaving my country. I, I thought I would find a job and probably live uh, in the city where I was born and uh, grew up. Uh, but there was an opportunity to come to US. Uh, uh, you know, I always, when I was uh, younger, I always liked science fiction movies and, and stories. And uh, one of my favorite movies was Indiana Jones. Uh, so when I, Me too. <laughs> I'm glad we shared the, <laughs> the preference. So when I was in uh, in uh, graduate school studying physical chemistry, there was an opportunity to come for an internship to uh, an institution where the person who was actually uh, the origin of Indiana Jones' story worked. Uh, so this was a lab at Carnegie Institution of Washington in Washington D.C. So I went there for uh, a summer internship for uh, four months in 1998 and somehow stayed on. <laughs> so it's been almost 18 years. <laughs> That's great. I don't know why, but you just, you reminded me of that scene in the early part of Indiana Jones where one of his students, a woman, uh, bat, bats her eyes yes, at him. Yes, I remember that. Says, I love you <laughs> on her eyelids. Yeah, it haven't happened to me yet, <laughs> but I'm working on this. <laughs> maybe one day, maybe one day. Maybe one day. <laughs> so how did you get out to Hawaii? Um, so I, I worked at this institute in Washington, D.C. For, for seven years. It was a, a blast. D.C. is a great place, uh, especially if you're a foreigner, because there's a lot of foreigners there, a lot of uh, things happening. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I started doing experiments at these particle accelerator facilities. One of them was uh, in Chicago at Argonne National Lab. Um, What's so a particle accelerator? Uh, it's, a, it's a very big facility that costs a lot of money, and it accelerates uh, elementary particles like electrons or protons. The, the, the parts of an atom. Yes, yes. At high speeds. At high speeds. So why would you want to spend your time doing that? Uh, there's many reasons. So some f particle physicists, for example, they accelerate particles and smash them against each other to see what are the components of an atom. Uh, in, in my field, we use particle accelerators to produce very, very intense x-rays. So x-rays are uh, like the ones that are used in, in a dental office or to, to take uh, pictures of your lungs, um, are an invisible kind of electromagnetic radiation. And in my field, we use them to study the atomic structure of uh, matter. We look at atoms and bonds. So it's kind of like a super, uh, super electron microscope. <laughs> Just works uh, on a slightly different uh, principle. So I started traveling to one of these particle so this accelerators. This is physics. This atomic, is physics. Atomic physics, can I say that? Yes. So let me give me just a footnote here, because we're doing a show on Hiroshima. Sure. And, you know, the, the Navy is celebrating, Navy in Nagaoka, Japan, is celebrating 70 years of mm -hmm. peace since the, since the bomb went off. But um, what, how, how, does, um, uh, how does nuclear fission work? And, and I don't want to spend a lot of time <laughs> on this, but in a minute, how does it work? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not a, a nuclear uh, okay. physicist in a sense that uh, I, I don't study processes that, that are used in uh, nuclear explosions. Actually, the, the, the facility in Chicago, this Argo National Lab, was built during the Manhattan Project era. Uh, and it was doing some research on 
weapons back in the days during the Second yeah, World yeah. War. It hasn't been doing this for a long time. I'm sure. So r right now, uh, it, they actually use it completely for, for peaceful purposes, for okay. uh, you know, uh, finding technologies that have applications in cell phones, in batteries, okay. in cars. Um, yeah, so this facility in Chicago, it's a user facility. So it's a, uh, it's a facility that is funded by the Department of Energy has staff scientists who build uh, and operate the instruments, and then people from universities who have ideas of experiments, they apply for time on this instrument and come bring their samples and, and do the experiments. So in 2007, I, I moved to this facility to become one of these staff scientists and work there for another seven years. <laughs> Seems I have you, a, you already had your PhD by this time? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. This was, this was uh, long, uh, long after. And I, I enjoyed working in Chicago a lot. Uh, it's a very vibrant place because there are these uh, people who come for experiments. They bring their students. You work with somebody else every two days. They all are very original people. They have their uh, very unique uh, ideas of what they want to study and why it's worth studying. So you, maybe you learn from them. Yes. You, <laughs> if, you, if you hang out with uh, enough smart people, you, yeah. uh, you, you learn a lot. Excuse me. I'm having a a technological issue here. Okay, thank you, sorry. So, uh, so one, one aspect of what I was doing uh, that I enjoyed particularly was actually teaching students. <laughs> and you couldn't do it in a regular fashion working at the Department of Energy uh, National Facility. So, so I started looking around and this opportunity at the University of Hawaii uh, just emerged. It was a very unique opportunity because uh, HIGP was one of the leaders of, of uh, extreme condition science, the science that I do. Uh, so they had very well equipped lab and, and uh, tradition of, of doing this kind of research. And uh, the, the person who built the lab over the years and was very accomplished, um, he's close to retirement. So the university was looking for a replacement and they offered me the position. So I, I moved here two years ago and uh, I've been having a blast <laughs> so far. <laughs> Well, you know, that's the thing in science, you know, moving is, I mean, it depends on who you talk to, but moving is um, easy, it's a part of the career path, and sometimes you have to keep on moving for sure. some, some sciences. I, I talked to an English astronomer on our current OC-16 mm -hmm. movie, um, and he had been everywhere. He must have had ten places under his belt, and I said, did you like moving like that? He says, I, I have to, it's part of astronomy, you have to move around. Is it, is it part of extreme, extreme science? It's interesting that you use this analogy or, or the comparison with astronomy because actually what we do in, in my field is quite similar in terms of needing access to these big expensive instruments that you could never afford to build or, or purchase yourself. So, so yes, we, we travel about uh, every month or two for experiments, always to other places, to Chicago, to Berkeley, with sometimes. Other, who, who has who it's, have instruments. It, yes, go for the yes, instruments. yes. So it's, it's usually a whole group that travels. The experiment uh, is very intense. We don't sleep for about three days. We prepare samples all the Get time. And, yeah. uh, but, but it produces something interesting every time. And then you come back and you spend the next couple of months figuring out what it means. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. Now, this, is, this goes beyond particle accelerators, right? There's other kind of instruments. Involved. Sure, sure. What? <laughs> uh, so in, in my field, uh, what, what I do is I study the effects of pressure and temperature on the properties and behavior of matter. So we try to squeeze and hit different things for different purposes. When you use uh, little pieces of rocks, you try to simulate the conditions of uh, Earth or other planet interiors. Sometimes we take something that has a meaning for energy industry and try to see whether we can make it more stable or contain more energy. Uh, so in terms of need for tools, there are two aspects of it. One is the source of x-rays. And for this, you have to go to the facilities like the one in Chicago. The other one is the apparatus that you use in the lab to generate pressures and temperatures. So this is something that, that we have here in Hawaii. There's a couple of different versions of this instrument or a couple of different types of instruments that we use. Uh, the one that is probably the most cool is uh, called diamond anvil cell. So we, we use uh, gemstone quality diamonds because they are the hardest uh, possible substance. For our experiments, they are shaped in a slightly uh, modified way. We polish down the tips so they are not spiky. You wouldn't use this for an engagement ring? Uh, you could. <laughs> well, it's not particularly large. The diamonds that we use for research are usually about 0 0.3 carat. 
So I, I think it's pretty decent, but you wouldn't impress your girl. <laughs> You'd have to tell her the whole story. And yes. Then you would impress her. <laughs> well, what, unfortunately, what happens a lot is we break them. Mm -hmm. So diamonds are not forever, at least not in my lab. <laughs> so during the course of experiment, you put your sample in between the two diamonds. You squeeze it really hard. Uh, one of the advantages of using diamonds is that it's optically transparent, so you can see through. Samples are tiny, so you have to look under the microscope or with some specialized spectroscopic tools. But you can basically see as your sample changes when it changes. Uh, so if you overdo it and if you, if you go to too high of a pressure, your diamond shatters into, into shatters. pieces. Yeah. That must be something to see a diamond shatter. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. we'll, take, we'll take a short break. Um, we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to see some of your slides. Sure and get a handle on uh, your science. And that is, uh, what is it, extreme condition science, extreme condition yes. research, which means extreme conditions in any form. I was thinking maybe it's just weather, but it's not weather. No, it's not weather. It's anything extreme having to do with any material and uh, any combination of elements, I suppose. Pretty much. It's the, the term extreme uh, refers to the thermodynamic parameters, so pressure and temperature mainly. Uh, OK. Ooh. It was just getting interested, and it's getting exciting. Uh, that's uh, Chris Dira. He's with HIGP. He's a scientist. Uh, he's doing extreme condition research. And we'll take an extreme break. We'll be right back. This will be extremely short, actually. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Ko means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Ko. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Chris Dara with HIGP, talking about extreme conditions and material sciences. Yes. That's fascinating to me, because you're, you're, you're inherently you're doing material science. Pretty much, yeah, and in different contexts, but yes, it's material yeah. science. So I mean, if I if I'm doing research on some kind of um, you know a combination of elements that I want to be hard or soft or pliable or what mm -hmm. have you, resist hold, cold or heat, whatever it is, I might talk to you about that. Absolutely, I'm the person. It actually, t to me. Uh, Extreme condition science is something like a modern version of alchemy. So, you know, <laughs> alchemists in, in medieval times. Why didn't you tell me that before the show? We would have named it alchemy. Modern alchemy with the Christian. Yeah, absolutely. I have a picture of an alchemist in one of my illustrations. But uh, the reason why, why this, uh, this comparison works is, uh, you know, the, the main goals of alchemists were to look at very unusual behavior of ordinary materials. They were trying to turn uh, ordinary substances like lead into gold, change their properties, the way they behave. Uh, they also tried to look at processes that in normal, under normal conditions take very long time and see them in accelerated form. That's, that's a definition from Wikipedia. Did they achieve those things? Uh, I, I guess not, not very often, but we are doing much better at this. So, so to, to give you an example of how this uh, high pressure or extreme conditions alchemy works is uh, if you take any gas, let's say that, that we trapped uh, some of the air in this room uh, into a container and squeezed it to the kind of pressure that, that we reach in my lab every day, uh, it would turn into stone. Stone? It would turn into air crystal. Into stone. Yeah, so every gas that is present in the air, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, they have a solid form at sufficiently high pressure. So what we usually do in my lab is we solidify gases or we squeeze things that are already crystalline and look at what happens. Do they stay uh, as solid? <laughs> Normally not. <laughs> yes, they, they uh, well, there are some exceptions. And I, I have some examples uh, from, from uh, research we have done. We're going to go to the pictures now that uh, Chris uh, Dira brought. 
And here's one. So Chris, explain what's on there. All right. Then. So you, you have a picture of, uh, of my alchemy lab uh, on a day when I didn't shave for, uh, <laughs> for a week. Uh, uh, so again, this is, uh, this is uh, just to illustrate that what we do it kind of follows the, the general goals of what alchemists did in the past. W what we do has several goals. Uh, we either look at materials for the purpose of uh, finding better materials to synthesize something that uh, doesn't form uh, under normal conditions and requires pressure and temperature. But one of the main contexts, and contexts which is particularly important uh, for my work at uh, HIGP, is, is the context of earth science. So uh, Earth is a very complex and dynamic system. It's the planet that we live on. Uh, and we have these major uh, geologic events like volcano eruptions and earthquakes. Uh, so for, for the purpose of, of being able to prepare for these events and live in some harmony with the planet, we have to understand how the planet is built, what are the components, what kind of properties and, and processes occur at different depths and so on. So I, I think in elementary school, children learn about this uh, onion model of the Earth, that we have different layers, crust and mantle sure, and, and the core. center, it's really high. Yes, yes. So that's what we do. Is uh, that true? Of course, okay. yes. <laughs> so if, if you, you know, I like science fiction movies. One of uh, my favorite movies was Man in Black. I don't know if you remember, there was a, a cat, his name was Orion, that was wearing a, a, a necklace with a universe in it. So what we do in my lab is kind of similar sometimes to uh, this necklace with a universe. We put a piece of iron into a diamond anvil cell, this small device that you can generate high pressure and temperatures. You hit it with a laser, it melts. You have the molten lava inside the diamond anvil cell. So it's like having a piece of earth core that you can hold in your hand. OK, OK. It's very hot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be careful. Extreme science can be dangerous sometimes. No, I, I was going to say that. I mean, if you're dealing with extreme of anything, it could, I, I wouldn't say blow up, but it could shatter. Sure. You don't want to be there when it shatters, right? All these things. Yeah, I think one of the keys to keeping things safe is making them really small. And small is kind of a requirement of uh, extreme condition size. So pressure is the, the more uh, mysterious of the two variables that we normally change during experiments, pressure and temperature. And pressure is force over surface area. So the two ways of generating very high pressure is either to squeeze very hard, apply a high force, or use a very small uh, surface area. So we usually choose the second because it's easier and safer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So our samples are about uh, a tenth of a human hair size. If we talk about crystals, these are little crumbs of rocks that you cannot see with your eye. You have to look under the microscope. You can apply a lot of pressure yes. on that surfaces. OK, let's go to the next picture. This is the one about making gold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, the, pr the problem with understanding how Earth looks uh, on the inside is that we cannot really access it directly. And again, if you, if you look at books and, uh, and movies, people had ideas about exploring it uh, in vehicles or going through some tunnels like Jules Verne uh, imagined. Uh, Jules Verne, right? Yes. To the journey to the center that's of the right, Earth. Right. That's right. That's right. That was one of my motivations to become <laughs> extreme scientist. <laughs> Uh, so, so far, unfortunately, we haven't done so well with, with uh, drilling deep into the Earth. There was a project in 1960s in Russia that managed to drill 11 kilometers. And from the engineering point of view, it was quite an accomplishment. This is a science project. Th this was basically an engineering project, but it was motivated by trying to understand the, the composition and properties of rocks. Okay. But you know, if you look at the Earth uh, uh, size of the, of the Earth uh, globe, the, the radius is... Uh, Three and a half thousand kilometers. So eleven kilometers is, is almost nothing. It's barely scratching the surface. Um, so so the way that we use in the lab with uh, putting little pieces of minerals into a diamond anvil cell and hitting them with a laser provides us with uh, at least an ability to simulate the same kind of uh, violent extreme environment that you would find at the center of the Earth. Uh, and way cheaper. Way cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, simulate meaning put the pressure on and see how the rock in the center of the Earth yes. will, will react to that, will become molten, get hot, and all that. And, and now, why would you want to know that exactly? Uh, so th there's, there's many of these big geologic phenomena, like the earthquakes and the volcano eruptions, that, that can really uh, affect our civilization. Uh, we have tsunamis and so on. And we understand the general principles, the general mechanical phenomena that cause these events but we don't yet have a very good predictive power. We cannot predict that an earthquake will happen there at a certain day, unless 
the, the earth is already shaking. Yeah, yeah. So research like this, which uh, helps you to understand on a more exact level all of the physical and chemical changes and processes that happen inside the earth, I think they help you to be more exact. So we, what we hope to achieve in geology context, just uh, beyond uh, basic understanding of fundamental processes, is to, to gain a better predictive power for, uh, for avoiding disasters or preparing it for disasters. Because so, you have multiple things happening at the same time. Sure. So yeah, our approach is to try to simplify things. Uh, I, I think one of your previous interviews with our HIGP director had the title that nothing is really simple. <laughs> so in my lab, we try to make it simple. Uh, we, we take something really complex. Yeah. So for example, a rock that is present in Earth mantle is composed of something like 10 or 15 minerals. Every one of them is a different chemical. They react with each other. They, uh, they undergo transformations themselves. So we try to take this problem apart and simplify it. We take individual minerals and we see what happens with them. Then we put them in pairs and we see what happens with them. And then when you're trying to predict you know, natural forces, you put them back together again. Yes. <laughs> what a joy. Yeah, one, one thing we, we cannot do in a lab is, is uh, simulate the time scale. Yeah. So Earth had a, a very, very long time to evolve. And a lot of these processes that are important for earthquakes and volcano eruptions and plate tectonics. They take millions of years, and we only have days, maybe hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the lab. So that's, that's well, the challenge. But you can part. take what you learn in the lab, and you can extend it by, by some hypothetical yes. time feature, and, and then find out exactly what happens over time. Yes. Yeah. yes. So we, the, the discipline of earth science, which deals with this kind of uh, simulation, is called geodynamics. Dynamics usually means evolution over time. So what, what we do is we work with people who are theorists. They use computers and equations. Uh, they take the information that we measure on our rock samples. They put this information into their equations and tell us what it means in terms of you know, continent formation and so on. So when you say equations, I mean, that always interests me. Uh, it's not an algorithm. Uh, maybe it can make I think it's both, yeah. yeah. It's, it has to be both because the the calculations that you have to do are very complex. So it's very rare that you can solve the, the, the math that is needed to understand the problem with a pencil and a piece of paper. Usually, it's, it's, uh, you have to develop the idea of how to describe it in terms of mathematical equations. And then you have to use a computer to, to do the simulation, to do the calculation. So there is some algorithm development involved as well. So and then it's a, it's a huge, big. Um, model. It's a model. Yes. And you need heavy computing power Absolutely. To, to make the calculations. Uh, and you do that at HIGP? Uh, I, I don't do that myself. I collaborate with people who do something like this. We have a brand new building and uh, a, a supercomputing facility on campus, so we could do something the like David, this in David the future. Hall. Yeah. That's right. I've been there, yeah. <laughs> it's very impressive, uh, it very modern and uh, well, it supports what you do. Which Absolutely. Is great, you know. Absolutely. It's a great resource. There's no question. Let's go to the next picture. We have, ah, there it is. All right. So this is an aerial picture of the particle accelerator facility in Chicago. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this kind of particle accelerator is called a synchrotron. So what you have is in the center, there's a, a big electron gun that shoots electrons. And uh, along the circle, there's uh, many, many very strong magnets that deflect the beam of electrons. So the electrons just circulate uh, along, the, uh, along this uh, round building. Uh, the circumference of this building is about one kilometer. So it's nice for exercise if you do these overnight experiments. You set up some measurement, and you walk around, and you get back in uh, 15 minutes or so. Depending. What's the process that makes the particles move, uh, accelerate? It's, it's an electromagnetic uh, process, so you so use magnets. Magne mm -hmm. So the magnets draw the, draw the electrons. Yes. Elec then. Electrons are charged particles, so if you use electromagnetic field, they can be accelerated in uh, electromagnetic field. And when, whenever the electrons turn, whenever they accelerate, there is x-rays emitted on a straight trajectory. So that's how we get the x-rays for our experiments. So does, the, does this process push the particles or pull the particles? Yes. Well, it does both, actually. Sure. So the right. electrons, uh, they circle around at relativistic speeds, so speeds close to the speed of. Uh, so how, what's the diameter on that uh, donut? Uh, the, 
the circumference is about one kilometer, so okay. the diameter would be uh, about a third of that. I remember reading a few years ago, not too many, two or three years ago, that China built a particle accelerator. Yes. They wanted to show us just how good they were, and they built one, and it was huge. Is, is that really big? Uh, I think you're talking about a facility which is exactly uh, an analog of this one. Really? There's a brand new one that was built in Shanghai. Uh, they, they put a, a strong effort into designing the architectural part, so it looks like a snail. Uh, shell. Uh, it's quite, quite beautiful, very competitive. I mean, in, in this field, uh, there's right now about 50 of these synchrotrons through the world. Uh, US was uh, probably the, the, the most advanced uh, 20 years ago. Right now, Europeans, uh, there Japanese. There's a big one in Switzerland somewhere. Yes, there's, uh, there's a fairly large one uh, in Switzerland. There's a new one built in, in Spain. So. A lot of countries see the advantage of having an advanced facility like this, even though it's very expensive, but it enables research mostly into, uh, in the direction of creating new technological materials, materials for you know, more advanced cell phones, computers, chips. Interesting. Well, how do you get from watching the electrons move to a more advanced cell phone or computer? Uh, well, Material scientists, people who design new materials, new chemicals that you use in advanced technology applications, uh, they have to understand the atomic makeup of, of their chemicals. And they use x-rays for this. So if you take x-rays produced by this uh, synchrotron facility, aim it at your sample, and look at the pattern of scattered x-rays, you basically can see atoms. <laughs> it's like this idea of, of a very powerful electron microscope. So by seeing how the atoms are arranged, how they are bonded, you can think of ways how to modify this bonding pattern to emphasize certain so physical characteristics. properties, characteristics. Uh, oh, that's really exciting. And that happens. That's how they make these cell phones. Absolutely. Wow. That's pretty serious business. And that means that it will continue to happen, it, that we'll be finding better materials, better characteristics for especially cell phones. but all kinds of other high-tech equipment, yeah. I, I think there's a very good chance for this. So as, as I said, uh, these facilities, they keep growing uh, in different countries. And in US, there's a still a strong support for this kind of research. There was a new synchrotron ring like this uh, built in uh, Brookhaven on Long Island uh, just last year. Uh, so, so there's a continued investment. And I think it's a wise investment. It's an investment that brings long-reaching uh, advantages. One more question before we take our next break, and that is, it strikes me that uh, you know Sony recently, I mean, uh, I couldn't say months, probably mm -hmm. months, came out with a battery um, that lasts for 20, 20 years and had multiple cycles, lots of cycles, and um, it generates 1.2 kilowatt, kilowatt hours, and it's being sold now by a, a local company, mm -hmm. um, and for, for home storage, you know, for the people sure. off your roof going to change things, I think, because, because it's going to last so long and, and it's so, so well made. But if you, if you have access to material science this way, if you can tell what the, how the elements and atoms in those elements in a battery are doing, you could invent a stronger and stronger battery. Or for that matter, you could probably invent a, a more efficient um, solar panel, too. So we can get to the root of all of all materials on Earth that way. Absolutely, and I can, I'm not very familiar with this new Sony development, but I can, I can bet that there was this kind of research, research involving x-rays and synchrotrons, uh, that took part in, in this successful development. So companies are also present at, at particle accelerators like this, and they, they do their own uh, commercial uh, research as well. Ah, so it's not just pure research, it's commercial research. You're getting excited yet? I'm getting excited. Now it's all coming together for me. All right. <laughs> Chris, at HIGP, as you know, this is, this is something. This is going to affect us increasingly going forward. We'll be right back after this short break. I can't wait to hear more. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the State Senate, which, please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. 
This is a terrific venue for people to learn about healthcare. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. We're here with uh, Chris Dira of HIGP, and the pace of this discussion is <laughs> growing more exciting. Uh, we're talking about extreme condition research, and that means extreme condition on everything, on every material, every atom, and you could learn so much. But you were saying in the break, Chris, that sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. It's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, this, this is one of the aspects of, of extreme science that I really enjoy. So th there's a lot of important basic science that is very uh, incremental. It's, it's kind of uh, very systematic, but it rarely brings exciting results that you didn't anticipate. And this, this is usually not true about uh, extreme condition science. Because of the way we do these experiments, we put these chemicals together and we squeeze them and hit them with lasers. It's often that we see something that we didn't anticipate and it's often something that takes a pretty long time to figure out why it happens and what you could do with it. Yeah. But when you learn, it's an aha, right? Yes. It's, it's really something that might take you in a whole new direction, sure. new ideas. Yeah, so an example of this is uh, several years ago when I was still in Chicago, we, we worked on uh, high pressure and temperature experiments with rust. Okay, so rust is an, uh, a product of oxidation of iron, which is an iron oxide called hematite. It also occurs as a mineral, so we were more interested in the mineral aspects of it. Uh, but there's only few iron oxides known. There's uh, hematite, there's magnetite that is used in magnetic tapes, and then is wustite that is present in, in the earth uh, lower mantle. So basically just three compounds. And, you know, people worked on iron and oxygen system for basically centuries. Chemists look at it from, from the beginning of, uh, of chemistry, from the alchemist times. So it was very surprising to see that at fairly moderate pressures but very significant temperatures, you can make a new, new form of iron oxide that nobody has seen before. So this, this was an exciting uh, discovery that uh, um, a, a young uh, researcher working with me made in 2009. And, uh, we are still uh, trying to figure out what you can do with this new iron oxide. You can actually, once you make it, you can take it out. Nobody has seen it on the air. So you're holding a substance that is like unique. Uh, unique. Yeah. It probably exists somewhere because you can find various pressure and temperature conditions in, you know, in different places. But, but that was very exciting. This, this reminds me of the, uh, the stadium. Mm -hmm. The stadium, uh, the ball stadium out there in sure. Iowa, uh, one they don't use very much because it, uh, it's a total failure engineering-wise. But um, they, 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 they didn't want it to rust. So they applied a, a rust that was not supposed to rust. Okay. And this rust was supposed to protect the stadium from rusting. The problem was that the rust did rust. <laughs> That's quite unfortunate. <laughs> it, it was several years ago, so that they, didn't, they have the benefit of your research. Thing. Yeah, yeah. But theoretically, with this, you could find a rust just like the kind they wanted, a rust that wouldn't rust. Yes, yes, yes. That's the idea. I mean, we, we often look at oxidation processes that happen at pressures and temperatures and with time. Uh, and yeah, we, we normally don't do, um, most of my experiments are, are focused on basic science, so we, we don't target certain technological applications directly. But quite often the, there's uh, implications and, and ways in which you can apply what you learn into a, into a technological context. So let's take an example of that. So you're working uh, on rust maybe or something, and uh, I don't know why. Wait, did you wake up one morning and say, I think I'll do rust today? Uh, you, know, you saw some rust and it inspired you. <laughs> I, I must know more about rust. Anyway, so you learn something sure. by accident, you know, that, that could have a commercial application. Texture. Sure. What do you do with that? Uh, well, it's, it's a pretty long road. So with, with most of extreme uh, science uh, research, there's always a challenge of uh, cost of, of making these new materials. We, we often see things that are unique and, and have unique properties. But if you wanted to make them on a large scale, it's, it's a different story. It has to have economic sense. Right. So there's, there's, you know, if you found something that really has a big potential for commercialization, there's a scale-up process. We, we use these small devices that you can see through and see with your eyes how the samples are changing. So this is usually the first step in which we see, we see the novelty, uh, uh, you know, um, first. Like the, a miracle. 
Yes, the, the second step is in, in our lab here at HIGP, we have uh, large machines that use hydraulic grams to squeeze much larger quantities. So if we see that something is worth making in larger quantities, we use these hydraulic presses. We can make grams, maybe, of the new substance. Mm -hmm. And then if it still turns out that it's worth making at larger quantities, there are other uh, you know, more professional, more more commercial settings in which you can uh, try scaling. But the question is always whether this is worth, yes. uh, worth the money, whether it's economically feasible. Yes, so w w one area of application where uh, high pressure products have successfully been uh, uh, you know, used in, in technological applications is abrasive industry. So diamond is one of the things, we, we break diamonds in our experiments, but you make them at high pressure, just like earth makes them in high pressure processes in, in the interior. Artificial diamonds being yes. an example. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So we, we can do things like this in our lab in Hawaii also, we can make diamonds. <laughs> Actually, it turns out that you can put any carbon rich material, for example, a, a, a chocolate bar, put it in one of these hydraulic presses, and if you know the conditions of pressure and temperature, you squeeze it hard enough and you'll get a diamond. Yeah. It's, it's fun to give those away to girls too. Can we look at some more? We have a couple of minutes more. But let's look at the rest of your slides. Sure. So this is an example of uh, the variety of minerals that you find in the earth. Uh, as, as I said, part of what I do uh, is done in a context of understanding the transformations of uh, components of the earth interior. So we have a diagram that shows how different minerals present in different layers of the earth look and uh, how they transform into each other. The, the picture at the top is a, a peridotite fragment, and you have the, the main minerals in it. Uh, one of them, the prominent one, is olivine, which is green. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is something uh, that we found in the lab. So uh, we talked about the alchemy and changing the uh, fundamental properties of, uh, of materials. Uh, on the left side, uh, on the right side at the bottom, you see a diagram showing uh, pictures from a microscope on little pieces of this uh, pyroxene mineral from, from the mantle that was uh, pressurized in diamond anvil cell, you can see that it turns from completely transparent to completely non-transparent. So something electronic uh, with the arrangement of atoms changes inside. That we, we now know what it means. And what we are trying to, uh, to understand now is uh, the, the picture on the left side on the top shows you uh, um, where the seismic activity happens, where we have big earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So you, you, I'm, I'm sure you heard about the ring of fire that is around the Pacific Ocean, where the, where the plate boundaries are located. So the tectonic plates, when they collide with each other, one of them ducks underneath and gets yeah. dragged into the mantle. Yeah. So that these colorful pictures in red, they show uh, how the shape of this subducted slab looks like. And uh, what, what seismologists derive from their uh, interpretation of uh, listening to the earthquakes is that there are some subduction zones where your plate kind of ducks into the lower mantle. And there are some others, like the one at the bottom, where the slab stagnates at some level. So it what, doesn't drive down. That's right. That's yeah. right. So it, it has some consequences for possibilities of, of earthquake uh, triggering within these subduction zones. And what we are trying to do is to link uh, our little pictures of mineral transformations into these big uh, processes, into how, how the slab buckles and how the earthquakes form. You know what this says to me? Mm. Conductivity. Yes. Conductivity is definitely uh, a very important phenomenon. You would expect that the change of color, your sample, from looking like a non-metal, starts looking like a metal. These are usually electronic phenomena. It's very that, good intuition. I'm, I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, circuit boards, tiny sure. miniature, tiny things that can do amazing Absolutely. things. At an atomic level, even, you know, who knows what. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, conductors and metals is another area of, of active research in uh, high pressure science. I, I don't do very much of this myself. It's mostly through collaborations. But quite often, when you squeeze elements or, or metals at some point uh, in pressure, you can see high temperature superconductivity in materials that don't normally display this kind of properties. And again, it's, it's kind of a very fascinating phenomenon. It, it's quite expensive to try to think about this in a technological uh, context, because you would need to be able to generate this kind of pressures, which are very expensive to generate on a large scale. But still, it tells you something fundamental about, uh, about your So matter. is the equipment getting more sophisticated? 
Actually, if you look at the evolution of, of these diamond anvil cells over the last 50 years, they haven't changed that much. You cannot really do much better than diamond. Diamond is still the, the hardest substance that we have. Yeah. Um, mechanically, it's basically like a vise. So if you have your screws and, and uh, springs that hold the pieces together. Are you, uh, one last question, at least in my curiosity anyway, are you also looking at um, particles and pieces of matter that come from like asteroids from, from space uh, to find out their properties? Yes, yes, quite often. So th there are two main uh, questions that we try to address. One is if people find natural pieces of, of meteorites, uh, you want to understand the story that they tell you about the formation of this meteorite, how it, how it was ripped apart from the planetary body where it originated and uh, what happened with it. So one of the things that we study often is uh, shock polymorphism. So polymorphism is uh, ability of one substance to occur in different forms, like carbon occurring as graphite and diamond. Very different properties. It's the same atoms inside, but they are arranged differently. So something like this happens often as a result of shock phenomena, for example, impact shock. If you have a meteorite which strikes the surface of a planet, it generates high pressure and high temperature conditions, and understanding this is what we do. Uh, so I, if we still have a moment, the last, uh, last the last slide, 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 the slide. I, I think that will be something that will probably excite you a little bit. So I talked about alchemy. Uh, this is uh, basically alchemy in diamond anvil cell. Uh, we did some experiments mixing hydrogen with xenon, two gases. Hydrogen is uh, a well-known gas, and xenon is a noble gas. It's a, it's a, what do you call it? It's, uh, it's static. It's, uh, not, not an, it's an inactive. In, inert, yes. Inert. It's, it's a noble gas. Yeah, okay, inert, okay. that's right. So what was expected is that these two gases would just solidify without mixing, without reacting with each other, because xenon is known to be inert. What we found is that at some combination of pressure and temperature, you actually get a crystal, a, a piece of rock, that contains both hydrogen in very large quantity and xenon. Actually, if you freeze this, you can take it out, and it's still a piece of rock. You have to keep it at low temperature, though. So when, when we published the results of this work, there was a little bit of interest in the context of automotive industry, because you know, fuel cells that, uh, that use hydrogen is one of the directions that uh, automotive industry is looking at for, for future uh, replacement of gasoline. Are you saying that you can put it into the rock, and then you can get it out again? Yes. You have ah. to keep it cold, though, right? OK, but still. <laughs> It's a storage mechanism. Yeah, it's and, and instead of using high pressure, to high pressure, you use cold. Sure. Keep it in one place. But you have to use the pressure first to make it. But it's not yeah, yeah. very significant pressure. Problem so far is that xenon is probably more expensive than. <laughs> the old problem. <laughs> but at least we found something that seems uh, seems pretty yeah. unique and uh, intriguing. Well, thank you, Chris. This has been a great discussion. Thank Open, you. Opened our eyes to so many things. You're in a, in a relatively unique area. I think we really appreciate what you're doing and how it affects people. And I, and I have a feeling we're going to be hearing about extraordinary advances in this area. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Christira, Christira, HIGP, Extreme Condition Research. Thank you very much. Aloha.